Good evening, everyone, and thank you for coming out in this cold weather. My name is Christopher Lidke, and it is my pleasure to inter introduce the third and final lecture today conducted by jo Dr. Jonathan Morduck. <clears throat> thank you to the Osher Lifelong Learning Institute and the Uni University of North Carolina at Asheville's Economics Club for sponsoring this event. <clears throat> Dr. Jonathan Morduck is currently the professor of economics and public policy at New York University's um, Wagner Graduate School of Public Service. Please enjoy this talk on how microfinance works for the poor, and there'll be a short question and answer period held at the end. Make sure that you please speak right into the microphone as this event is being recorded. Uh, now, without further ado, please join me in giving Dr. Morduck a warm bulldog welcome. Thank you. This is great. This is my third chance to engage um, here, and it, it has been a great pleasure to be here in Asheville um, today. I hope this evening we can be a little bit more um, relaxed, so I could just talk and talk, and then we could have a little Q&A, but um, I would be very happy if you have questions or comments or thoughts in the middle of what I'm saying to just interrupt, put up your hand, um, go to the microphone, or just ask the question, and I'll repeat it back into the microphone here so everyone can hear it. Um, so feel free if you want to um, engage or you've got thoughts and just can't hold on to them, we can just talk about it. So we'll just try to make this a little bit relaxed um, because it's um, because this is inter interesting stuff, and I really want to share um, some thoughts about microfinance, which is something I've thought about a lot for a long time. Um, but just like anything that one's thought about for a long time, your ideas are always evolving, and sometimes it's helpful just to talk them through and um, go back and forth and share ideas rather than just um, do things more formally. So if you feel the urge to ask a question or have a comment, just let it let loose. Um, this is a real pleasure. I want to spend some time together talking about microfinance and what really works and what doesn't really work. And it's a question I often get asked because I've written a book called The Economics of Microfinance. And um, when you write books with titles like that, people say, hey, well, what is this thing? Should I really be excited about it? And what I want to argue or share with you is some evidence and kind of emerging ideas that suggest that, yeah, this is really exciting, still exciting, as exciting as it was you know, 20 years ago, when people first started um, thinking about this, it is exciting, but not for the reasons that I think were exciting 20 years ago. I think our understanding has changed, knowledge has changed, evidence has changed, and, um, and with that comes a new understanding of what microfinance is. So that's why I call the talk How Microfinance Really Works. So a little bit about this. Now, microfinance is not a um, not a little intervention that no one knows about. It's a pretty big intervention. And in fact, this is Muhammad Yunus, who won the 2006 Nobel Peace Prize for his work in um, founding this idea of microfinance. What the idea really is, is creating a new breed of banks or financial institutions that reach poor households, that reach poor families. So. Mohamed Yunus won the Nobel Peace Prize together with the bank he created, the Grameen Bank of Bangladesh. And Grameen Bank is pretty amazing. They've created a financial institution that works where other banks refuse to go. They work in the poorest villages in Bangladesh. They work with the poorest people in those poorest villages in Bangladesh. And they seek them out. And in fact, they say, if you have too much land or too many assets, we're not interested in serving you. We are a bank that's really focused on people who don't have a lot of other options. And he's done something, created a financial institution that people didn't think were possible, was possible. Governments failed, commercial institutions failed, and for doing what he did, and for doing it in such tough circumstances, and also for doing it in a country in which women have fewer traditional opportunities than men. In Bangladesh, a traditionally Muslim society where women are not um, very active in the labor force, but creating opportunities for women, reaching women, now serving over 8 million customers, about 97% of which are women, um, 
He won the Nobel Peace Prize. That um, innovation, that bank, the Grameen Bank, has led to replications around the world. I doubt that there's microcredit in Asheville, but there could be. And it, certainly in New York City, we have microcredit. Um, around the U.S., we have various um, forms of microcredit. It's an idea that has legs. You see it in South America, you see it in Africa, you see it in other parts of Asia. It's an idea that um, is really catching on. And it, it comes up from some really simple ideas. The basic thought is, let's think about what banks do. Think about what they do well and think about what they don't do well. Now, traditional banks are really expensive. Right? You've got a branch, it's a solid operation, it's there in the center of town. It's really designed for people who are you know, part of the normal economic life of a, um, a pretty big area. People of financial records, financial experience, who are able to navigate that. Muhammad Yunus said, no, we're going to rethink this. We're going to take the bank to the people, and we're going to do it in a different way. We're not going to have bank branches. We're just going to set up. We'll come to the village just like this. And we will have meetings every week where we will do our banking um, operations. So in, in one way, they take one form of convenience, which is a bank branch. They get rid of that, but they create some other kind of convenience, which is coming to the village and serving customers right there with their neighbors. So this is a typical Grameen Bank uh, meeting. And the other thing they did that was notable and that got a lot of attention from economists like Joseph Stiglitz was that they created a new form of lending relationship. Now, the reason why traditional banks aren't interested, for the most part, in serving women like this who are served by um, um, Grameen Bank is, one, they're just not familiar with this customer base. They haven't taken the time to get to know um, the qualities and characteristics of the customers. Two, the customers have no banking relationships. So there's no credit record, no, nothing like that. So there's not a lot of information. But banks are worried that since the women are so poor, they have no assets to put up as collateral, right? No money to pledge to say, hey, I will repay this loan. Grameen Bank says, we realize if we're going to lend to you, we're not going to be able to accept collateral. Because if we did accept collateral, there would be no... Uh, if we insisted on collateral, there'd be no business here. So banks are worried because they don't know the customers and there's no collateral. So what did Grameen do? Well, you might know the story. Grameen said, look, let's think about a new way. You may not have collateral. You may not have assets. You may not have title to a house. You may not have title to property. But you do have something else which is very special. You've got a set of relationships. You've got friends in the community. And if you can get your friends together, and you can each promise to help each other out, and to support each other you know, when times get tough, we're going to lend to you. So Grameen said, hey, we're going to come to this village. We're going to create this banking relationship. But you need to talk amongst yourselves, create groups of five people. And each of those groups of five people is going to start getting loans. But the five people have to support each other. And so if one of them has difficulty repaying loans, then the other five have to lend support. And so there wasn't collateral, but there was a sense of, um, sort of social support, social pressure, social help that made this process work. And now Grameen Bank argues um, and reports that almost all of their loans are repaid. Without collateral, serving some of the poorest women, some of the poorest areas in Bangladesh, they report that loans were repaid about 98% of the time. Yeah. So that's a great triumph, and it has inspired a movement that is now global, and that is, as I said, is happening in the US. The latest numbers look like this. In fact, they're a little higher now. Um, the 2010 figures get us over 200 million people served by microfinance around the world. That's what gets people's attention. And people who look at these numbers say, you know, that's, that's, even that's not really big enough. If you think about it, 200 million women, really, well, they've got a family of five. So if you multiply 200 times five, you get up to a billion people who are touched by microfinance. Right? Those are real numbers. 
And it's coming from an intervention which is, um, which is new, which is simple, and which is some mix, some interesting mix of commercial and social. And it's that that I want to spend a little more time talking about. So just to wrap it up, the uh, early vision, and this is what I want to use as a jumping off point, is this group lending relationship. Come as a group, we'll serve you as a group. You get individual loans, but you'll help each other out. Two, focusing on women, traditionally excluded, real opportunities for social change, economic change, and also a better track record for repaying loans. And the third part, which I didn't stress, is loans for people to use to build small businesses. Muhammad Yunus said, you know, there are a lot of women out there who could run small businesses. Little shops or um, you know, raising livestock, raising goats or, um, or cows. And they've got the ideas, they've got the connections, but they don't have the capital to get started. So if we could just give them a bit of capital to get going, to buy a sewing machine or buy livestock or um, replace inventory, they could make a big go of it. They could really transform their livelihoods. That's the vision. So we're seeing this vision playing out in different places. Here's a, um, a set of photographs from around the world that were taken by a friend of mine named Robin Seidman. Um, this is a group in Mali, Africa, which is, we know from the um, newspapers right now is in the middle of a uh, uh, civil war, essentially. Um, but it's a, been a place where microfinance is starting to flourish. This is Limpopo in South Africa, um, where a group of women themselves have sort of taken over the uh, management of these groups. And here you can see them repaying at one of their weekly meetings. And this is Afghanistan, um, where a group of women who are hard to reach um, have come together through this process to help each other out and start small businesses. So that's the big idea. And now I want to start talking a little bit about um, what it really looks like and suggest that some of the innovations are unexpected and, and actually um, open up new possibilities for microfinance. So anybody have any comments or questions they want to share, blurt out, anything? Here. Yeah, microphone's right there. So if you just step back, you can grab it and we can talk. I spoke too soon. Hi. Why? Hello. <laughs> Why the focus on women so much? That's a great question. Why the focus on women? Um, two reasons. One, I think Muhammad Yunus felt if you want to make a difference um, by reaching people who really don't have good access to finance, it's women. Their husbands tend to have better access to finance, so you're not going to make as much of a dent if you're serving people who are already reasonably served. So women was an important um, element. Second element was, you know, Muhammad Yunus said, women are, are central in the family. They're often running family budgets. They're um, critical to making sure that school fees are paid and food gets on the table and those kinds of things. So socially, there's also a, can be a bigger impact by lending to women. And we see those um, kinds of results in other places. And there's actually a third thing, which is it tends uh, to be that women are repaying loans more often than their husbands. So from a purely operational standpoint, women, because it has less to do, I think, with anything about gender, but it has more to do with options. Because this option is particularly valuable if you don't have other good options, and men because the way things are arranged, tend to have other good options. If you don't have other good options, you're going to value this one especially. That helps the program do well. So there's less to do with women, more to do just with the nature of the economic um, constraints. It's a great question. Okay. And I'm glad to start a conversation. Um, so here's, a, here's something really interesting, though, about this. Okay? So everyone talks about group lending, but you know, when I look at these programs and, and others, it's not the most striking thing. And in fact, Grameen Bank has now um, stepped away from group lending. They don't actually do what I just described. That's how they started. They don't do it anymore. Well, they do something else. And this is, um, this is a way of introducing that idea. This is what you'd expect. 
if a loan is being made to, um, to folks to help them grow businesses, what you would expect is that the loan would look something like this. You, the bank lends money to the business owner, to the woman who's starting their business, right? They get a chunk of money. You expect the customer then to um, invest that money, right? This is a typical business loan. Then you'd expect them to sell um, whatever they've made. This, in this case, a woman um, got a sewing machine, and she um, makes some beautiful cloth garments. And then you'd expect her to be able to repay with interest, right? That's a business loan. That's what we all learn in economics. That's what things look like. But that's not what Grameen Bank does. And that's what's so interesting. In fact, what really happens is this. Somebody borrows. They get a big chunk of money. That part is what happens. And then, immediately, women start having to repay the loans. The loans are split up into a year's worth of weekly installments. The bank comes every week and takes 1 52nd of the loan. So the process that actually happens looks more like a consumer loan, looks more like an installment loan. Right? Rather than waiting for the customer to take that money, invest it, and make some profits, and then repay, instead, right from the next week, you're repaying that loan in little bits. That's really striking if you look at financial contracts. It's not at all what you think should happen. It's, in fact, the opposite. It looks like a consumer loan, not like a producer loan. And that's not the only thing that's kind of interesting about this process. So we got this the weekly repayment schedule. The other thing that's interesting is that the loans are made, and then they're repaid. And then immediately, the customers get another loan. And then immediately, well, after that one's repaid, they get another loan. And then immediately, when that one's repaid, they get another loan. And it's a continuous cycle of getting loans. That's also pretty striking, because usually, if you're really in, in business, you'd get a loan, you'd buy a sewing machine, you'd you know, work and repay the loan, and then you know, you're sort of done for a while. Then eventually you might want another loan. But this idea of continuity is something special and different. And what's so striking about this process is that it starts to look after a while a bit like saving, right? Just like saving up in weekly increments. You save, you save, you save, you save, you save, and hey, then you've got a chunk of money you can use. You save, you save, you save, you save, you save, and then you've got a chunk of money you can use. After a while, it's really hard to separate these things out. That is really striking. Or at least it's striking to someone like me who has been following the economics literature and trying to understand the secret behind what's going on. So part of the secret is these are talked about as business loans, but they don't look at all like business loans. They look like consumer loans, and they also look like somewhat like savings. So that's striking. And now I'm going to draw a connection to something happening not in microfinance, but in the informal sector. All right. So we're good? OK. I want to share some insights from a colleague of mine, Stuart Rutherford. Um, he was co-author of the book, The Portfolios of the Poor, which I described um, earlier today. Um, he wrote another book called The Poor and Their Money. And Stuart. Um, lives in Nagoya, Japan, but he works, uh, he has a microfinance institution he runs in, uh, in Dhaka, Bangladesh. And the poor and their money is the story of different kinds of informal mechanisms, financial mechanisms that he learned about as he went around the world trying to understand um, how to set up his microfinance institution. So here's one. This is from um, Nairobi, Kenya. The slums of Nairobi, Kenya. And Stuart describes a Raska run by a woman named Mary. A Raska is a rotating savings and credit association. And it's a really simple device that we see all over the world. Now, it's like microcredit in that it's a group thing. And the basic idea is that if you didn't have access to a bank, how would you get chunks of money that you need? Well, people like Mary say, well, let's get a group of our friends together. Let's pool our money. And the way that Mary's Roscoe works is that she got 15 members together, 15 friends together. They each put in 100 Kenyan shillings a day. And on one of the days, some member of the group gets the whole pot. 
right? So Mary might put in, put in, put in, put in, put in, and then eventually, you know, seven days later, she gets a chunk of the pot. And it goes on until each member has gotten a chance at that, that total 1,500 um, shillings. And then they might start it again, or they might not, but it depends. The key thing here, the key insight, and in how it relates to microcredit, is that it's really the same thing. Little amounts that are being put together to create a big amount, or as Stuart says, a usefully large amount. And so that's, that's one, one example I want you to hold on to, OK? Roskas. Here's a second one. This is an example from India. This is really striking. This is a deposit collector. Deposit collector is something we don't see here. But the basic idea is, you know, it's hard to save. So this woman, Jyoti, works in the slums of a, um, a city in South India. She helps you save by coming around to you and taking a deposit from you every day. Right? You say, hey, I'm having a hard time saving. Jyoti will come to you. She'll take um, a little deposit from you. She'll take 10 rupees in this case. And she'll do that for 220 days. And at the end of that process, she'll give you her, your money back. And she'll take a fee. And it turns out that this service is so valuable that people pay an interest rate. They pay to save. Right? We're all used to, well, we hope, getting interest, right? If you calculate the interest people are willing to pay for the service, it's negative 30%. They're essentially giving her 30% in an annualized rate. Right? But she does something really valuable. She's helping people take those little bits that add up, and she's giving them back a big chunk. Again, this looks a lot like what's happening with microcredit. Little bits turn into a big chunk. And the final bit is a money lender. This is an example of an urban money lender in India. They work the same way. They give you a loan, a big chunk, and then they expect you to repay it in installments. So in this case, it's weekly repayments over 10 weeks. And the money lender takes the interest rate up front. It's very expensive, but it works the same way. Big chunk, small bits. So you can see the connection to what's going on in microcredit. It's not just about group lending. It's not, it doesn't look like a typical business loan. It looks a lot like some variant of these things. In fact, it looks a lot like this. It's weekly installments um, until the loan is repaid. That, I want to submit, is part of the genius of microcredit. And why does that matter? That's the next question. Why does this matter? Why am I belaboring this point? Why am I giving you these examples? Well, I want to say that this has been underappreciated. It sort of changes how we think about things. Because banks now are no longer explicitly lending against a risky business. Right? The banks didn't want to go in because they were afraid. They didn't know if you would be able to make it as an entrepreneur. They didn't know much about you. Instead, what the bank is doing here and what Grameen Bank and all the others are doing is breaking these repayments into little bits. Little bits that are small enough, and this is the key, small enough that you'd probably be able to pay them even if your business didn't do well. Little bits that are small enough so that you can take a little bit of money from what your husband's earning, a little bit of money from something you're doing, a little bit of money from someone else in the household. You can put it together and usually make your repayment. Little bits that are small enough that you don't have to save up to make that big payment at the end of a typical loan. So it's essentially lending against household cash flows rather than against a business. That's important because it gives households flexibility with how they're going to repay the money. It means that households don't have to save up for this balloon payment. And it makes it possible for households to use microcredit for lots of purposes. Because it looks, as I said, it looks like a consumer loan. And not surprisingly, we see people using microcredit for consumption purposes. And that's where I want to turn to next. Okay. Before I go there, any thoughts, any questions, any comments? You don't have to go to the mic unless you want to. Because I can, hi, yeah. Um. 
in this process, and this process worked with um, people outside necessarily the extremely impoverished and low and low income. Can it work in like middle class and even upper middle class uh, fam family incomes? It's a great question. So, is this just for the poor, or could it work for the middle class or um, middle? lower middle class or other people who are not the poorest of the poor? And the answer is, yeah, it could work, sure. Why doesn't it work? Or why, why, why is it not um, being offered to people who are wealthier? The reason is they have better options, right? If you actually do have collateral, then you can offer that to the bank, then you can go to the bank, and you could probably get a better interest rate. And you wouldn't have to deal with the monthly, the weekly meetings in your village. You could just get in your car and go to the you know, local branch. You'd have an easier time. You'd probably have a credit record. You'd have a whole series of things that would give you advantages. Right? But if you don't have those options, this can be a very appealing mechanism. Right? Does that answer the question? Yes. Yeah. But yes, in theory, it could work for anyone. Yeah. Um, what kind of interest rates are they facing, and how is this different from money lenders or loan charts in, in these areas? That's a great question, too. I'm going to show you some evidence on that. But basically, um, the interest rates tend to be between 15 and 40% after inflation. So that sounds high. I, I hear that. Um, sounds high. It's a lot lower than the money lender. Money lender is probably charging 100%. So you know, 15, 20, Grameen Banks uh, charges about 20%. Um, that's a much better deal. But it's still high. And people do care about interest. And we'll talk about how we should talk about that, OK? But I'm glad you flagged it. We'll come back to it. Anything else? Yeah. I mean, I should say, just parenthetically, you know, to put that in context, remember that people are paying 30%. They're paying to save, right? So paying 20% to borrow, at least that, that frames it a bit. OK. One more question, and then I'm going to push forward. Yeah. What types of incentives are there to, to pay the money on time back? To, as in, uh, how, are, how is this program being enforced in case somebody defaults or doesn't pay their money? Yeah, so what kind of incentives are in place to make sure you're doing this? Because you don't have collateral, so why are people doing it? Well, there are really two things. One is, if you aren't repaying, then you lose out on a steady flow of, of loans. Right? Getting capital, getting access to an institution like this, a reliable institution that's working for you, that's there in your village, that's really valuable. So if you don't repay, you lose that relationship, and that can be really costly. Right? So that's probably the biggest thing, just wanting to stay in good graces. The other thing is, to some degree, these groups right, that are formed. If you don't repay, then the loan officer is going to go to your neighbor and say, hey, we had this deal. you got to help out here. And your neighbor may help out, or they may just come to you and make your life very hard. Right? So it's another incentive that's probably more powerful than the other ones. Yep. So that's the basic idea. So I promise you we're going to go from this and say, hey, OK, we've got this going. The system's working pretty well. But what are people doing with the money? And also, let's get back to the interest rate question. So what are people doing with the money? Well, it's hard to get data on this, but I'm going to share with you some sur survey evidence we have. This is data the World Bank collected together with the Gallup Poll Organization. So this is data from all over the world collected, collected by Gallup. And when you look at what people are doing kind of in the social realm, the biggest thing they're doing is using loans to pay for health expenses and emergencies. Right? And that's really smart. People, people value that loan from Grameen Bank because They've got things um, that are pressing that they need to pay for. They need to pay for a doctor. They need to pay for medicine. And here's cash. School fees, another thing, right? We enjoy public education here. School fees are not a big deal. But we have some costs. But in places like Bangladesh, India, uh, Africa, school fees um, can be high. It's another big use of funds. We also see people improving their homes. Um, <coughs> and some other ceremonial expenses, weddings, and funerals. Okay. In Indonesia, which is one of the other homes of microcredit, we ask these same questions. You know, How much is for business? How much is for other things? Well, we had a sample of um, borrowers of microcredit. Some were poor. Some were less poor. Some were um, not poor at all. And none of them were 
really using it entirely for business. About half of it was used for business, half used for consumption purposes. So it's really in line with what I was suggesting. These loans are structured in a way that allows people to use them for lots of things. Health, education, home improvement, consumption, and business. But business is only one of the things. So the narrative of microcredit has been really powerful. The narrative has been all around business, and I think we like to hear that. Right? We love the idea that we're helping people start businesses and you know, grow their income and support themselves. There's something very American about that, the idea of entrepreneurship, and we're helping you know, millions of entrepreneurs around the world. That's very powerful. And it's a great thing, but you know, there are other narratives that are also compelling. And it turns out that for customers, starting a business is only one concern, and there are other concerns um, that also matter. This is evidence from Mongolia, just to give you a different example. We had Indonesia, we gave you a global example. This is from Mongolia. Again, about the same thing, about half of all the microcredit business loans are actually being used for household purposes, big purchases, paying down more expensive loans, um, dealing with ups and downs of consumption. And the final case, um, before I move on, is from Peru. To give you a totally different example, um, something similar. This is actually an interesting study that Ask people directly what they were doing with their loans, and most of the time they said business. They rarely said for household purposes or health or education. Those are the, the dark gray blocks over there. They rarely admitted to it under 5% of the time, around 5% of the time. But researchers used a novel method to actually elicit what they were really doing. And once they did that, you can see the lighter gray um, bars. And it turned out that a third of the time, or 25%, or in the last case, 35% of the time, um, they were spending for education, health, and um, household items. So the bottom line is microcredit has really been powerful for um, households, but not necessarily for the reasons advertised. The reasons advertised was these are business loans, and we're helping people grow their income. The truth is these are general purpose loans, and they're designed that way, they're used that way, and people are using them that way. And the question is, you know, should we see that as a problem? Well, some do. I think it's actually a good thing. And I think it's a platform that helps households make needed um, purchases and helps them do a lot of things that you know, we all want to do. Keep food on the table, keep kids in school, stay healthy. So that's part of the, um, part of the argument, OK? So, this new vision, then, is about helping people with general use finance. It's about building reliable institutions, because being able to count on that finance matters a lot. It's still about focusing on the most advantaged, disadvantaged, and also about taking people's behavioral constraints seriously. And what I mean by that is you know, breaking those payments down into weekly installments that are manageable, that keep it on someone's mind, that you know, work with uh, people who have a hard time you know, saving up for something that's months away. Just keep it weekly, keep it simple, break it into small bits, keep it manageable, right? We can all benefit often from, you know, those kinds of um, structures. Okay, that's what I want to say on that. And I want to turn, I want to shift gears for a moment um, and spend a little bit of time talking about two bigger ideas, social business and social impact. So the social business side is, well, what's the, um, what's the sort of business model that's driving all this and what can we learn? The social impact side is, well, what is all this adding up to in the end? What difference is it making in people's lives? Okay. So before I shift gears, any questions or comments? We've been doing well. Yes? Well, it sounds like these loans are being given to people because if they had credit cards, they would put it on their credit card. And so it's basically it's a substitute for a credit card. Some of the time, that's about right. But a credit card is a very valuable thing. And if you didn't have a credit card, life would be a lot harder. Right? Well, that's and, what I'm saying. Because they don't have credit cards, they're using these micro loans. That's right. That's, that's, I think that's a helpful way to think about it. And you know, the only uh, thing I want to say is you know, credit cards here, we um, you know, have, sort of have a mixed reputation, right? Because it's easy to abuse credit cards. A lot of folks have. Um, you know, too much credit card debt. But essentially, yeah, that's what's happening. Making it easier for people to pay for the things they want to buy. 
whatever they are, just like a credit card. That's a great point. Thanks. Yeah, I'm just curious as to how, um, if this is sustainable long-term growth that we're talking about, if it's just consumption spending and not investment. If they're not actually using it to improve their lives and invest in a business and actually improve the economy, how is this actually like long-term growth? I understand it short run because they're spending it on goods, but. So I want to go back to this graph um, and the others. Health and education, I want to argue those are two of the best investments you can make in terms of long-term growth. It's not the standard narrative of microcredit, but keeping those kids in school, keeping healthy, being able to stay on the job and support your family, those are incredibly helpful and important investments in the future. Right? So I'm just saying we still want to keep an eye on long-term growth and development, but there's a broader way of thinking about it right? that expands beyond the traditional narrative of microcredit. Okay? Thanks. OK, social business, social impact. So what's really interesting about microcredit is that it's inspired people not just to think about finance and lending, but also to think about this broader idea of social business. And social business is really just a kind of business, like Grameen Bank, which is a business, it's a bank, um, but which has a social end. So we're not talking about corporate social responsibility. Right? You're familiar with corporate social responsibility? So you know, the Gap's Red campaign, right? So the Gap you know, is a for-profit commercial enterprise, sells clothing, but then they you know, have um, initiatives that you know, um, send money to Africa. We're not talking about that. Maybe a good thing, may not be a good thing. Um, we're talking about businesses whose central purpose is to do good. We're talking about businesses like Grameen Bank. We're talking about businesses like um, an ambulance service that started in Mumbai, India, because there wasn't an ambulance service. And too many people were dying because they weren't getting to the hospital. So let's start an ambulance service whose mission is to do good. We're talking about an eye hospital designed to make sure that poor um, customers in South India could get the um, corneal transplants that are way too expensive for them. Let's build an eye hospital that's a social business, tries to get its money back and charge the customers who can pay enough to be able to cross-subsidize poor customers. It's not charity. It's a business, um, but it's designed from the bottom up with a social end. Okay. That's what microcredit is um, kind of the leading edge of. And I want to talk about how that idea then works, actually works in, uh, works in the microcredit side. So here's a little bit of data. Um, no. Here's a bunch of books. I'm sorry. There's a bunch of books um, which uh, just give a sense of how um, the social business side um, has been evolving. Okay. Um, these are, you know, this idea of social business that uh, microcredit has kicked off has been picked up by people like Bill Gates and Warren Buffett in a book called Creative Capitalism. It's been picked up in. Um, a book by an economist writer, a book called Philanthrocapitalism. Um, a whole series of different writers and thinkers are looking to these ideas that are not charity and not government, but something in between, the power of unreasonable people. And so this is um, where microfinance uh, becomes the leading edge. So here's the microfinance model. The first step to make this work as a business is to drive down costs. And they've been very successful at this. This is the cost per borrower. And on the bottom is the average loan balance per borrower um, adjusted by income in the country. Bottom line is that the, the bottom line is really a proxy for how poor the customers are. And you can see as you go to the left, you're serving poor customers. The institutions that are poor, serving poor customers have really been able to cut costs per borrower. And they do that just the way you saw in that picture. They bring people together. They don't have bank branches. They have great efficiency in how they um, engage with people. They do things in a very, very low budget but effective way. And it's been a real triumph. So reducing costs per customer has been a real success. That's been really important. So here we've got the same um, axis on the bottom. So again, the poor customers are toward, the, um, toward me, toward, uh, toward the left, or your 
left, yes. Um, this is the percentage of women borrowers. And you can see the women in particular have been looking for, um, in experience so far, the smaller loans. Where the focus on poorer women, particularly in South Asia, um, smaller loans. And that's also been um, very effective. So by being able to bring loan sizes down, bring costs down, also being able to um, reach women who have been looking for smaller scale investments rather than the much larger investments um, that men tend to uh, invest in. So that's another big thing. So this idea, which Muhammad Yunus has been pushing, has been um, to not make a profit, but to earn enough to cover costs, and then plow all the extra money back into the business to make it um, grow more. So Muhammad Yunus argues it's got two advantages by trying to be more business-like. One, you can expand based on your earnings. And two, you don't have to worry about your investors. You don't have to worry about the stock markets, because you really have just one bottom line, and that is um, solving a difficult problem, a social problem. So what's tricky is you're sort of somewhere, though, between trying to do good on one hand and, you know, trying to sort of think of it from a business perspective. And those two worlds are often very difficult to reconcile. You've got the social and you've got the financial and you've often got, you know, same, you know, these very different people within the same organization trying to do very different things. That's the um, struggle of... Um, microcredit. And that's a struggle of most social businesses. Let me show you how this works out in practice. One of the things they've achieved is to reduce the costs per borrower. But they haven't been able to reduce the cost per dollar lent. Get that right. They're making very small loans. So even though they've reduced the cost of you know, going into a village and doing transactions, those loans are still very small. So if you look at the cost per dollar lent rather than the cost per borrower, it's still true that it's cheaper to make larger loans to richer people. Okay. So they made a lot of progress in reducing costs, but they haven't made so much progress that they've overcome this fundamental tension it's still really expensive to make small loans. It's still really expensive to take small deposits. Operating at that scale is still really expensive. And they haven't overcome that. And that's a key tension that we're going to see throughout social business and especially in microcredit. There's always then going to be a tension, uh, sort of uh, pressure to move up s the scale, to move to richer customers um, in order to save money. Is that clear? Okay. Second thing, this is the other tension. Because the cost per dollar lend is still high, because those um, small loans are um, you know, so hard to make and so costly, you know, in order to do something that looks like a business model, they've got to charge high interest rates to those customers who are engaged in the smallest transactions. right? Those customers are engaged in the most costly transactions. They're going to be charged the most. And that's exactly what we see. So we're talking about interest rates. And I said, on average, they're 15 to 40%. But that 40%, this is a, a proxy of the interest rate um, on the y-axis there. That 40% is mostly charged to the poorest customers because they're the most expensive. If you want to serve the poorest customers, you're going to have to charge them more. That's the microcredit logic. And not everyone's going to like that. But that's a reality. If you want to start a business, if you want to cover your costs, you're going to have to charge your poorest customers more than your richer customers. That's just the equation. Okay. Any thoughts or comments? So that's a tension, right? That's a tension. And that, I just want to put that forward. That's a reality. Of, of doing this. I'm not saying it's particularly good or bad. And in fact, here's the counter, the argument to people who say it's not bad. This is Vikram Akula. He started a, a microfinance institution called SKS. And he said, you know, 
I don't apologize at all for doing this. I don't apologize for trying to be as commercial as I can. I don't apologize for charging high interest rates to some of the poorest women. And I'll tell you why. Because when I tried to do it, when I tried to do this and did not charge high interest rates, I realized I couldn't serve everybody. I couldn't grow. I couldn't cover my costs. So I had to stay in a limited area, a limited number of villages. And then one day, a poor woman came to my office and she said, why aren't you serving me? You're not in my village. Am I not poor too? Don't I deserve a chance to get my family out of poverty? And at that point, Vikram Makula said, you know, I've got to switch gears. I've got to charge higher interest. Because if I don't charge high interest, I'm not going to be able to serve the people I want to serve. And that's the tension. Reaching the most people or giving the best deal to a smaller group of people. And that's a value judgment. But the microcredit ethos in general has been charge more, reach more. But it's a, it's, this isn't all economics. It's also philosophy. Okay. So that's the idea. Try to escape subsidy and you know, make some tough calls. Now I want to say something that seems a little inconsistent. Okay? But it, any comments or questions on this? Because usually you know, this, not everyone uh, agrees with this view. And um, usually people have, uh, have some thoughts. So anything on this? Are we good? We got the tension? We're wrestling with it? Yes. The interest rate, are they, are, is interest charged on a weekly basis? Yeah, that's interesting. It, you pay it back on a weekly basis, but it's actually when we're talking about 15 to 40 percent, we're talking about an annualized interest rate just to um, compare it to you know, what you charge, what you get charged down at Bank of America or something. Yeah, thanks. Yes? Is the interest rate consistent with the source of the loan fund? Is the interest rate consistent with the source of the loan funds? And so what do you mean exactly by that? I'm asking because of, um, I put that from an SKS, and the fact that it's uh, commercial with IPO. So if the money was coming from donor, mm. that's not expecting any repayment, will the um, MFI still charge the same interest rate? Yeah, that's a great question. And I'm glad you raised that, because SKS is a special example, um, although the general point it still holds. In this case, right, S, um, Vikram Akula went one step further and said, you know, I'm not just going to charge high interest rates. I'm going to charge even higher interest rates because I want to make enough profit not just to grow, but to really grow extremely fast. And that means getting commercial investors excited about this. Right? And so he had an IPO because they were making tons of profits. And his thought was, that's the way I can be, you know, reach millions of people, not just hundreds of thousands. And yes, he had to charge higher interest rates um, and do things more cheaply than he otherwise would have. There's a big debate about whether that was a good strategy. SKS ran into trouble. Stock price tumbled. All sorts of um, complications. So it's probably a, a, another conversation for another moment, but I'm really glad you raised that point. OK, so here we go. Now I want to tell you a little bit about the um, actual truth. Um, this is based on some work I've been doing with um, colleagues at the World Bank. Okay. What's the actual um, evidence on subsidy? So I said, you know, the whole game here has been to try to get rid of subsidy, charge high interest rates, really be a business, and you know, try to do good in this sort of hybrid way. So w what is the truth with subsidy? Well, what I want to suggest is that the evidence is a little bit more complicated. So if you ask businesses, you look at their annual reports and say, hey, are you guys you know, actually making profits now? Are you charging high interest rates and making profits? You ask them, you look at their, um, their data. This is data on about uh, 346 institutions spread across 67 countries. Um, the evidence we found was that over 70% of them say they're profitable, right? And that's in their annual reports, et cetera. Well, the World Bank says you know, we need to adjust that a little bit because um, you know, there's a little bit of subsidy that may be coming through their um, cost of capital. When the World Bank makes those adjustments, um, that number goes down a little bit. 
but there's still about half of it. Uh, over half are actually profitable sort of in the social business vision. But two colleagues at the World Bank and I sort of went back to the data and said, you know, those adjustments are the right idea, but they're still not, um, they're not enough. We need to make more adjustments. And the bottom line is when we do that, we get there. About 25% of the institutions we saw were actually profitable. Bottom line here is that microcredit, for all the talk about commercialization and um, trying to be profitable, only about 25% of the institutions we saw were truly profitable, truly operating without subsidy. There's still a lot of subsidy running through the program. So that's one thing I want to leave you with. Um, I'm going to show you the data a different way, looking at the number of borrowers served rather than the number of institutions. So let me switch over there. So we could ask, well, how many borrowers are actually served by profitable institutions? And here, because the profitable institutions tend to be bigger, you can see over 90% of borrowers are claimed to be served by profitable institutions. Okay. But mixed market comes along and says, wait, wait a sec, let's do the adjustments. But they still get close to 90%. But when the colleagues at the World Bank and I have come back, um, we find very different numbers. We're getting around 50%. So about 50% of borrowers we see um, are actually served by um, profitable institutions. And what we find, move here, um, is that that means that you know, there are considerable subsidies that one way or another are, um, are helping these institutions do what they do. For the not-for-profit institutions, they're getting more subsidy, um, about $90 um, per borrower. And even the for-profits are getting some subsidy, um, a little over $50 per borrower. Okay. And what I want to suggest is that's not necessarily bad, right? right? Maybe that's a way to keep those interest rates from being sky high. But it means that we really need to have a conversation about impacts, really need to have a conversation about what those subsidies are buying. And we can't do as the industry has done, say, hey, look, we're making profits. Don't, let's not talk about impacts. You know, as long as people are paying the price for this, as long as they're demanding it, as long as they're coming back and borrowing again and again, we don't need to do social impact evaluations, right? There's no subsidy. But we argue, once you actually do more careful accounting, there is subsidy. There's nothing to be ashamed of, but let's have a real conversation about what it buys. And so that's the other part um, of microcredit. Now, I think we have 15 minutes. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. Yes, that's right. Um, so I was going to say a little bit about um, what we know about social impact. Um, but maybe I should just, uh, well, let me, I'll take five minutes on that, and then we're going to have a broader conversation. Okay. Um, so five minutes on social impact, and then, then we'll open it up again. Okay. So here, here's the question. What does all this subsidy buy? Well, one, it buys lots of inspiring stories because, you know, there are amazing things that happen when people get access to credit. And because subsidy still matters, donors have to tell inspiring stories to get people um, to give. And so we have lots of inspiring stories. The problem is that those inspiring stories, which are true and real, may not be representative. Right? So the question we want to ask is, what's the typical experience with microcredit? So economists ask that in a, a particularly focused way. They ask, what do we see has happened thanks to microfinance that wouldn't have happened without it? Right? What is the impact relative to some kind of counterfactual? Now, that's a hard question to answer, but it's important. So the question is, what happened with versus what happened without? And the difference there is the net impact. It's a hard question to ask ask because, of course, we don't see what happened without microfinance, right? Because you can't simultaneously have it and not have it. And so we spent a lot of time trying to estimate or um, extrapolate what would have happened without. There are lots of different ways of doing this, but I want to um, frame that conversation by first showing you a little bit more casual evidence. And that's going to come from something I talked about earlier today, um, a book called Portfolios of the Poor, where we got to know some folks um, in India, Bangladesh, and South Africa. Some of you heard about that. Um, 
these are surveys about 300 families. And here's what I want to share with you. What we learned in that process of really getting to know the families was that the world without microcredit is not a world without finance. It's not a world without financial access or loans. So here's one of the um, respondents in the um, diaries. And these are all of the kind of financial instruments that he actually had. He didn't have microfinance, but he had a little shop credit. He was remitting a little bit of money back home, he was, which is a way of saving. He had some wage advances. He had a ROSCA, like I described before. He had a whole series of different um, kinds of things. And so the without part of the equation is not zero. So the full impact of microfinance is less than you would think. He's got to net out what would have happened anyhow. Here was a, a family um, I introduced earlier um, today, and they have microfinance. Um, but then, as I described earlier, they've got lots of other things too. So even when you have microfinance, it's part of a world. It's not your entire world. And that's why when we look at the impacts of microcredit, the net impact um, may not be as big as a lot of people think. Okay. When we ask loan officers and other experts what they think the impact is, they think that roughly 25% of the customers, this is one example from Bolivia, 25% of the customers are really doing amazing things with it. About 60 to 65% are basically staying where they were. The money isn't helping them that much. And about 10 to 15% are actually going backward. So maybe they're under undertaking some businesses that aren't working out or um, getting into some other problems. Same kind of thing um, when questions like this were asked in India. You say about 50% were doing better, 25% same, 25% falling backward. So you can see it's a more complicated situation. So what do we know? Those are just expert views, and those are sort of casual views. What does a more rigorous um, academic study show? Well, it's really hard um, to do this well. And we've got um, a few academic studies, and they're really showing some pretty mixed results so far. Here's one I really like. This one isn't focused on microfinance so much as on the returns to capital to small businesses. So it's a very related question. How much more profitable would a small business be if they got an extra $100? Okay. This study is looking in Sri Lanka after the tsunami. There was money that a donor was giving. Researchers at the World Bank convinced them to randomize who would get money when and how much. So some people got $100, some people got $200. Um, they could see how much of a difference that money made. And here's the basic answer. Getting the extra $100, um, on average, increased profitability by about 60%. That's a lot. That's a big return on investment. right? There's no way that I could invest money today in you know, sort of standard options and get anything close to that return on capital. right? That's a lot. Interest in that context in Sri Lanka was about 20%. So this is really a, a huge um, boost. That's a very positive thing for microfinance. But here's what was striking. For men, they typically had a large effect. They broke this down into men, uh, results for men and women. Um, they typically had a large average effect. But even for men, about 20% of the people who got the extra money um, had returns that were lower the interest than the interest rate. In other words, if they'd actually had to pay for the money and pay interest, they would have been losing out. For women, the average return to capital is actually zero. So about half the women had returns that were less than zero, and half um, were above zero. The bottom line was when. You, when you know, the researchers looked more carefully at typical experiences. They were pretty mixed. Some people were doing really well. Some people actually falling backwards. It's about what the expert um, views had been. So what is, where does all that leave us? We've covered a lot, covered a lot of ground. But here's the first thing. This is an intervention which can be used lots of ways. That was the first thing I wanted to establish. Some people could use it for business if that made sense to them. Some people using it for healthcare, some people for education, some people to deal with ups and downs in their lives. 
What microfinance is really providing was general finance. And sometimes that's going to make a big impact in people's lives, and sometimes it won't. But what we do see, right, no matter what the impacts are, is that the early vision of creating workable, reliable institutions that function in difficult circumstances works and gets to scale and can make a difference and reach people who have been written off. And so the first thing that we see in all of this experience is that there's a real sense of possibility there that's powerful and that we should hold on to. But the second thing is that as we get more experience and more evidence, we need to imagine new possibilities. That early idea that this is all about business lending, that's not what the evidence is showing us. It's sometimes about business lending and sometimes not. So we got to think about what we're really doing and what we're achieving. How much do we value those other things, education and health? Maybe a lot. Maybe more than business lending, but maybe not. And so that's really where we're heading. As we think about that, it sort of becomes clear that finance really isn't just a business proposition. It's a platform for lots of purposes, just like the credit card we were talking about. And so there are all kinds of innovations that might be made possible thanks to microcredit together with another innovation. Like um, there's a great company called D-Light. They make uh, solar lanterns for people who are off the grid. But they're expensive. You might have to pay you know, $100 to buy one of these lanterns. That's a lot of money. But you combine that with microcredit, and all of a sudden, people might be able to afford those kinds, of, um, those kinds of lanterns. And then, all of a sudden, have light in their house in the evenings. And the kids can study. And um, they don't have to rely on expensive and unreliable sources of light. New cooking stoves, new, uh, um, new health um, products and medicines. And so my finance really is a platform for many purposes. That's the way households see it. And I think that's part of a new vision. But with that, we need to think more, um, more deeply, more carefully about social investment, what's really happening, and do more careful accounting, and really understand what's really profit and what's not. And that takes us, ultimately, to continuing these early steps that we've taken to assess impact and see how much it really makes a difference. I showed you one study. There are other studies. There's certainly a lot more to be done to put all these pieces together. But ultimately, I think there's, there's a lot of energy. There's a lot of hope. Muhammad Yunus won the Nobel Peace Prize in 2006, and I think it was well-deserved. But to do honor to his vision is to move beyond it and think about how we can really capitalize on these kind of innovations. So I will end there. Thank you.